Welcome to Rich Planet TV. I'm Richard D. Hall. Anyone tuning in today to watch the third program with Andrew Johnson about Mars, we've put that show back a few weeks uh, just to put out some new material about King Arthur. Many councils around the country are slashing their budgets due to the so-called recession. I prefer to call it a theft, but that's another subject. As part of cost-saving exercises, it has been reported recently that a small island in the Bristol Channel known as Flat Home may be sold off by Cardiff City Council. The island is currently part of St Mary's Parish, which is a church in Cardiff. Flat Home attracts about 2,000 visitors a year, but runs at a loss, and its disposal would save the council about £150,000 according to the budget papers. Why am I mentioning all this? I am mentioning it because South Wales has assets of huge historical importance that its current leaders do not seem to be aware of. One of these is the grave of the legendary King Arthur, and lies in a ruined church on Fortress Mountain a few miles northeast of Bridge End. If this site was made into a tourist attraction, this would create global interest, not to mention thousands of jobs and people would come from all corners of the globe to see it there would then be no need to sell flat home. But don't take my word for this. Listen to the experts in today's program. I'm reporting today on a fresh new insight into historical research which places the legendary King Arthur in Wales. I'll be speaking to two researchers who have comprehensively researched evidence pointing to the existence, date and location of King Arthur I and King Arthur II. I've interviewed Alan Wilson and Baron Blackett in the past for several TV programmes and covered some of their work tracing the King Arthurs. Today I have returned specifically to document the evidence which proves the existence, date and location of the King Arthurs. We're also going to screen some supporting testimony of six well-known professionals in this field. Britain has some very strange problems in that uh, we have a massive history, very well documented and recorded, and yet which is uh, attacked, in other words, and generally regarded as a huge forgery. The paradox with British history is there seems to be a preconceived mindset within an inaccurate framework. Mm -hmm. In other words, basically, the correct synthesis is not actually relevant to the actual tangible evidence which we've accumulated. Particularly as they relate uh, sites which are traceable, battlefields which are traceable, and all sorts of other buildings and ruins which are, again, traceable. Misguided political reasons, because mm -hmm. we have Arthur the I in Warwickshire, England, and Arthur the II in South Wales, so basically, rather than create a situation where people can benefit from it, they just basically try to rub it out right. completely. If we, if we look at it, we've got one or two salient points that have been attacked. One, we have an ancient British alphabet. Now, this was wrongly attacked as being forged and fabricated in 1800. So in 1776, he's recalling an inscription on an ancient stone naming a king who lived around the year 200 AD in memorial stone, and yet its uh, alphabet is not forged until 1800. So there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. This is what set us off to think, hey, hey, you know, there's something seriously wrong here. And we then searched and we found that all sorts of people had written and produced documents. Up until this date, historical professionals haven't spoken at length about King Arthur being in Wales. So just, just tell us about uh, the people who are going to speak in, this, in the programme today. Well, the, the paradox at long last has emerged that we've got six experts. I mean, the, probably three professors 
and other experts, historians of at least 30 years, 30 years standing, who actually agree emphatically that King Arthur II is from South Wales. Then we found Julius Caesar had described the alphabet. Now, hang on, this is getting a bit much. So we realised there was something very seriously wrong. Mm -hmm. So it was the discovery of this alleged forgery of the alphabet, which is not a forgery, that really gave the, the real act, like the atom bomb in Hiroshima, it blew everything apart, mm -hmm. that there's something seriously wrong. Then we've got things like the ancient bards of Britain. Again, a much abused volume, but in it, and this is an old book, is the same ancient alphabet. What date is that? This one, 1906, I think, this is one of the later ones. There's one of 1848 here. 1906, that one. This, quoting ancient texts, this is 1848, ancient alphabet. And this guy is, again, a scholar, quoting ancient records. Now, why they've got away with this allegation that was only made around 1936? Well, these historical professionals sadly have come quite a bit late, but it's, it's self-explanatory what they say. OK, well, let's take a look at it. In the scintilla of history that remains to us, a name appeared. And the name was Arthur. In the uh, Nennius Miscellany in the uh, Ashwellian Museum, uh, there are many things said about this hero figure. Only once had this hero figure been mentioned before, but that was unfortunately for everybody in Welsh. In the poem, The Godothin, in which the, the beautiful phrase, sinister, um, chilling, Phrase of Gohorai Brain di Arvir Kair Ernibo Evarthir. The ravens of the castle walls were glutted, though he was not Arthur. The first existence of the name in the sixth century poem. This identifies the time, the place, and the potential hero. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that there isn't a lot more support for developing the Arthurian legends in relation to Wales from the main quangos, essentially, that are out there. Because it really is in our interest to raise the profile, because even if the geography has contracted, it is still related to the Welsh nation and its heritage. And that, I think, is the key. You know, Arthur is part of our heritage. There is so much evidence for placing him in, in, in southeast Wales that... that it, it really is amazing that this idea hasn't been accepted. Well, I've never had any doubts um, that Arthur was a Welshman. I mean, in those days, yes, we'd have said ancient uh, Brit Brit Britons or Celts, but uh, no doubts at all. Um, his base, his power base would have been in what we call today Monmouth, um, by the Seven there. And, you know, that's where the legend grew and that's where the legend developed. And when we celebrate that fact, um, certainly with people from abroad, um, you have to mention, of course, the Glastonbury and all the, the lies and the frauds that went on there when they hijacked Wales. What's good now is, if you like, that the Wales, the Welsh people are claiming Arthur back to Wales and for Wales. And I think that's very important at this time in our history. Now, I've been working in uh, this part of the world for, in tourism for over 20 years. And when I first arrived, um, there were some, some voices telling me, you know, Arthur's the big story here. And I was surprised, I suppose, that, that with all the claims the region had, why people weren't making more of it. And I think it's a combination of things. There was, uh, I guess, um, a kind of organisational inertia to some extent, um, that, uh, that everybody knew that Arthur came from South East Wales. There was no dis disputing it as far as, if you like, the, the folk memory was concerned. But it was just one of those things. It was just yet another story from Wales. And there were plenty other, of other things, and there were plenty of physical evidence of other things that uh, were being exploited at the time. So I think it was probably uh, a combination of events. And, and, and I suppose, to some extent, people felt maybe we'd missed the boat. Um, when it was raised, people would say, oh, yes, but Tintagel's got the story, or Winchester's got the story, or Glastonbury's got the story. You know, what can we add? Uh, forgetting, of course, that perhaps you know this is where the original story 
actually was. We are not uh, being allowed to conform to the normal standards applied to any other nation or tribe on the face of planet Earth in the presentation of our history. It's unreasonable to expect that everything about our history should always be recorded contemporaneously. There is enough contemporaneous record in the stones and what the stones tell us about the people and what they say. Of course, they've taken the stones and thanks to a surveyor in Yorkshire, Mr Collingwood, they have misdated them and are busy redating them by five and six hundred years. That doesn't happen anywhere else. And this application of a double standard that no British record can be believed unless a Roman wrote the same record or a Greek wrote the same record or somebody else wrote the same record. That is being applied and it's clearly, it's something like a, a Gestapo trial. Uh, you will be arrested, given a fair trial, found guilty and shot. And that's really what they're doing to us. It doesn't matter what you've got. We know that given these unfair rules which are applied to this history, the British ancient history, and no other history, you can't win. And there's a very good story out there which hasn't been told very effectively from the Welsh angle. And I think if we could tell that story effectively from the Welsh angle, we'd have a lot of people now living in America now living in Australia, um, parts really, I suppose, of the uh, the old empire and the Welsh diaspora, who would be very interested in visiting Wales, perhaps coming over to Wales for different reasons, but thinking, well, I'll come over to the UK for different reasons, but thinking, oh, this would be a good opportunity to visit Wales, to check out some of these very interesting Arthurian legends. And we need, desperately, to um, tell those stories. If you put him in the right time period and in the right location, the area of his true realm, you can then really get to grips with the problem. Now, Arthurus at Myrig also bore the name Arthmile. And this is not unusual. Characters of that period, they often had several names. And what is really fascinating is that the name Arthmile appears on two or three Dark Age inscribed stones that can be found in the, the Vale of Glamorgan. He has been accepted in all sorts of cultures. He's been deracinated, that is, made without roof, uh, roofs, uh, roots. He's been denationalized, detribalized, and he becomes a world icon. And people will do with him what they wish. So he's part of the cultural icon in German literature, French literature, he appears in Spanish and Italian literature. And he appears fundamentally in the core of the lineage literature of royalty. Our Arthur now becomes the, the source by which the kings of England claim their right to rule. But all the time, if you read about him, in both the, what I call the reality, the actuality, the 5th century, the 6th, the 7th and the 9th century, and you see him in the new fictitious romantic practically pre-Hollywood but made to the mark the Arthur figure which you make of him what you will you give him what nationality you wish and um, give him what uh, accent you wish what class you wish but we the Welsh who created him have been denied him by the fact that he's so valuable as an icon an attractive popular figure uh, a figure for touristic uh, usage that the world has him. And all I wish is that we claim him back. We go back into the literature, the early Welsh literature, identify him for what he is, and go into the early Latin literature, and then, of course, go into Geoffrey of Monmouth, who uh, gave him the mark, having translated earlier books, of course, the mark of the Arthur we know, uh, which is part of the romantic history of the world. We'll find there's a very interesting reference to him in the Brutes of England. And you've got to remember that up until modern times, this would have been generally firmly believed as authentic history. So in chapter 79, it's telling how King Arthur is over in France, Brittany area. 
And it's on about the Easter time. And it says, And when King Arthur had thus his knights feasted at April after next sowing, sowing being springtime, he came again into Britain, his own land. And after at Whitsuntide next sowing, by counsel of his barons, he would be crowned King of Glamorgan. So everybody in Britain, certainly England and Wales, would have been in no doubt whatsoever from the roots of England that King Arthur II, at least, was a king of Glamorgan and Gwent, certainly king of Glamorgan. There can be no doubt about this. A very clear statement. In South Wales, we're, we're really missing out from the tourism point of view because the story of King Arthur really belongs to this area. It's been snatched. It's been taken and planted in the West Country where, of course, you have wonderful places like Tintagel Castle and Glastonbury Abbey, where the supposed grave of King Arthur was discovered in 1191. But really, it was just a publicity stunt by the monks who were trying to raise money to help rebuild their abbey, which had burnt down a few years previously. So we really want King Arthur in this area to help our tourism industry. If I had the money, I would commission an Arthur window to be in one of our great churches tomorrow. Uh, because we need that, you know, and the whole... I mean, I, I was brought up on the fact that Llanish did, um, Llangadog, that all these saints were the original knights of the round table. And when you read even the early research, you know, it makes sense. Because where does it locate Arthur? Black Mountains to Monmouth, that part of Wales. Um, so for me, these were native princes who became Christians, but were still knights, if you like, in, in the modern sense, yes, of the Holy Grail. They, they were drawn together by this Arthur figure um, and educated the same in Brittany, um, St. Samson. So, yes, we need places, not just churches, you know, because it, 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 it's a big, not just a big part of us, but we need to nourish our young people with this myth with this legend. It, it's a real... I mean, I look at it from a Jungian point of view as well, you know, that we have to make that connection um, because it is important. First of all, not much was written down at that time, but it seems as if whatever was written down was actually destroyed by the Anglo-Saxons who, who were, of course, attempting to get rid of this myth that there was somebody out there who was very, very powerful and could defeat the Saxons. So, I mean, you had it coming from all directions, really. There wasn't much written, and what little there was written was destroyed by his enemies. So it had to be recreated, if you like. At the, at, by, by the time the Crusades came along, we needed, of course, a history of, of, of successful, heroic leaders. And uh, you look back in history... Um, over the last thousand years before the Crusades, there weren't many of them that were British. That was the key, I think. Yes, um, Arthur, Arthur, obviously, in, 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 in terms of the stories that have come down to us and in terms of, of, of the history that as it's unearthed, um, clearly was a great leader. And um, perhaps not something that... Um, um, has been something Wales could shout about up until now. Um, we we have some history of doomed leaders, I suppose, like uh, Owen Glyndor and Llewellyn and so on, uh, ultimately um, who were seen to, to fail, perhaps through the, sometimes through their own flaws. Um, but Arthur, I think, is, is uh, somebody who we can take a lot of pride in and, and could be re very representative of a resurgent Wales. This is an area where the assembly government should really come into its own because um, you need somebody to promote it from the top. Um, there is a lot of ignorance about Welsh history, about Welsh heritage. Bringing forward ideas, tentative though they are, about the key Celtic Welsh historical linkages with King Arthur I think the Assembly should get firmly behind that. Um, in the same way as if Scotland had any chance of, of uh, linking with Arthur, they would have done it a lot more effectively many years ago, as they've done you know, with um, 
with, with Blue Heart, wasn't it? Was it Blue Heart they had, or was it yeah, Brave Heart? Brave Heart, as as they did with Brave Heart. You know, they they had some 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 hero there. They put a lot of money behind it, made a film about it. Um, I'd like to see um, a same approach, really, uh, to the Arthurian legend. We've got the wonderful backdrop to this legend, the castles that are still here and remain here, and some of which would have been would have been used by Arthur because they date back to Roman times. So Arthur would have been using some of these castles, probably particularly Caffili, um, probably um, also was the one on the on the way in, um, Carleon, Carleon and Caffili. They would have been using those castles. Um, so that's a backdrop for a fantastic um, film set. And we've got the story, and we've now got a young Welsh nation with its own self-governance for the first time in hundreds of years. What a time to, um, to reinvent this history of ours, which and sadly has been lost. And so I think the Assembly should get behind it. I, I, I don't think that there would be any pressure from the UK government to, to preclude that from happening. And, um, and I would look forward to the Assembly taking, um, taking a stance and um, putting some funding into the, the filming of that particular legend. It would do more for Welsh tourism to have a Welsh Braveheart film based around King Arthur than all manner of adverts in glossy magazines. The one thing that Caerlion has that no other pretenders to the Arthurian story is, is the factual existence of a real building which King Arthur used. The amphitheatre in Caerlion has been sitting in what has been called throughout the centuries by the people of Caerlion, King Arthur's Round Table Field. It was only rediscovered to be archaeologically an amphitheatre in 1927 by Sir Mortimer Wheeler. Before that time, the uh, depression in the ground was known as King Arthur's Round Table. And we would know that the amphitheatre existed, pre-existed before Arthur's time, that is in the uh, 3rd and 4th century, and that if Arthur did have a round table, he would have held Count Clear of his knights in our amphitheatre. That is the one thing that makes Caerlion entirely unique, apart from the vast mass of anecdotal evidence in the history and novels of time. Caerlion is well imprinted into the Arthur Arthurian saga that places what I call Johnny come lately, lately is that is 12th century places cannot match because Caerlion was here vibrant in the 5th century. Um, in South Wales, for example, the tourist industry is very important and we tend to have um, about 10 million um, bed nights, if you like, of, 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 of visitors coming through the South Wales economy, at least that number. I haven't looked at the figures uh, directly for a while. But if you think about each one of those um, spending, on average, over £100, if you could just increase that element of the tourist market, people who are coming here for activity holidays and historical um, uh, reasons and, and want more than just sand and sea. If you just think of a small increase in that market, you're talking about hundreds of millions of pounds uh, being injected into the economy. So anything that can raise our profile. And I mean, when we spend huge amounts of money on an advertising uh, promotional exercise that just tells people, come to Wales. It's a lovely place. But of course, there are lots of lovely places around the world. And therefore, you're competing against a huge market. But if you say to people, come to Wales, the heart of King Arthur's uh, uh, um, uh, cathedral, King Arthur's castle, the, the Arthurian legend, come here. This is really um, where the round table was, um, was, was, was promoted and developed um, as, 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 as a way of governance. You know, this, you know, if you could tell people this is where, the, uh, where, where King Arthur and his knights roamed uh, 1,500 years ago, you know, it's a much easier story to tell. So if you can just get across to people that selling wheels with or linked to a fantastic story 
that nearly everybody in the world now understands, King Arthur and his knights on the round table, link Wales with that. And you could conceivably get the message across that Wales is a place to visit far more easily than you would by spending huge amounts of money showing wonderful sea, sands and mountains. Arthur, the, the great myth of Arthur is that he, he sleeps ready to, to rise again, the once and future king. And, and I think now is the time when perhaps he will rise in a sense. Um, things have changed in Wales. We've certainly in South East Wales, certainly um, tourism in Wales, it's fair to say, over a uh, hundred years maybe, was based on almost the same the same philosophy as extractive industries. It was uh, it was kind of, you know, bring them in, give them give them what they expect, and ship them out again. And and to the same extent that we pulled coal out of the ground and sent it away, um, tourism was based on making things as similar to what people experience as home as um, one could. Whereas now there's a new paradigm for tourism. Certainly, it's grown up over the last fifteen years or so which is about pointing up our differences and the realisation that people come here on holiday or, or on a break in order to find something new, something different, that, that Wales is a different country and we should be uh, proud of that. And that certainly is far more evident now and that has only been amplified you know, ten times since the coming of the Welsh Assembly Government where we now have, you know, if you like, our own parliament you know, within Wales and, and the idea of Welsh culture isn't something we have to hide, keep to ourselves, keep private in Eisteth Vodai and so on. It's actually something that we're very proud about and we want to tell other people about. So, so I think Arthur's time perhaps has come again. This new evidence which Alan and I have brought to light, and Alan's been at this incidentally since for 60 years now. Mm -hmm. 60 years of research, his birthday was 80 last week. Mm -hmm. So he's, um, he's been he's a total expert. The Hawley family from Jerusalem arrived in Britain, and specifically to South Wales, in 33 AD. And it surprised us to find that the Church of Rome acknowledged this. And certainly um, Cardinal Baronius and Cardinal Alford around 1530, 1536, they were, they were saying this, you see. And of course, I, it's possible that the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, didn't wake up to the danger. Right. <laughs> None of us, they acknowledge this. And other sources uh, also then supported this. Mm -hmm. And we started finding manuscript evidence in Wales where, I'll read it out for you. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is a St. Caddock's genealogy, his father, his mother. And it goes back to the Virgin Mary and Bethany, the brother of Jesus of Nazareth, and Abelach. <laughs> Hang about, uh, is Abelach the Al Ab Alabach? You see, this leading Jewish person in Alexandria, where there were way over a million Jews living, anciently, in, in the time of Jesus, was the Alabach. Mm -hmm. And it's a title, not a name, you see. And so that set us off in another direction. But this idea of descent from the Holy Family is peppered peppered through the genealogies, and these are the most illustrious of the genealogies. This is the genealogy again of, of Owen, the big prince of Duffid, and his son, he's getting married, his father's how old there, yeah, how old they're good. Uh, and they say, after Amlach is a note, and it says, Amlach was the son of Beli the Great, and Anna his mother, who they say was a cousin to Mary the Virgin, the mother of Lord Jesus Christ. And it's, it goes on and on, you see. So what book is that you've got there, Alan, that you're referring to? This would be the Harleian uh, 3859. Right. It's one of the most illustrious manuscripts we've got. It is the, it is one of the priceless things. Mm -hmm. And it lists a number of genealogies of the ancient kings, you see. We try to stick to the facts, the figures, the evidence, as it is now emergent and more emergent in a more rapid progression now mm -hmm. and um, we must we think it's time it's high time that the seventeenth, um, eighteenth, and indeed 19th century still paragons and Victorian anachronisms are appropriately left far behind. 
Yeah. And we call any evidence. Mm -hmm. uh, in genealogy number two, listing the wife who's going to marry this. Oh, and that's all. Oh, it actually, again, it traces back to Magnus Maximus, you see. And the son of Magnus Maximus is Idinet in this case. It actually is the son of Arthur. It's Magnus Maximus, Arthur, and then I, they skipped him. And is that Arthur the First or Arthur, Arthur the Second? Arthur the First. Okay. No, in, in, what year is Arthur the First, Alan? Uh, he would be born around, uh, we would think, uh, given the date of his father's birth, is uh, around 345, something like that. Perhaps the most cogent evidence is what the stone, the memorial accession stones we found. Mm -hmm. For example, the one that was <coughs> revealed in Atherstone in Warwickshire, has been examined in a laboratory. It's been examined by a professional qualified archaeologist. Mm -hmm. and it's, it, has been, it has been authenticated. This particular stone is on the um, back of the Holy Kingdom book, which we co-authored with Adrian Gil mm -hmm. Gilbert. Old Berry in Atherstone, Warwickshire, is where King Arthur the first will probably be entombed. Mm -hmm. And he died around uh, again, give or take a year, year 400. Mm -hmm. uh, he is definitely, uh, in list number four, you've got Maxim, Magnus Maximus, who uh, kills Gratian, you know, and his son is Arthur, Arthur the first, you see. Mm -hmm. uh, and it says, Arthur the first, uh, who killed the ruler who killed Gratian, the king of the Romans, uh, okay? Well, Arthur and Magnus Maximus did invade Gaul in 383. They did confront Gratian, the Roman Emperor, at Soissons, 12 miles from Paris. They did defeat his armies, and Arthur chased into Lyons, lugged him and killed him. So we have Arthur I, son of Magnus Maximus. So we knew immediately, hey, we, we've got, uh, must have two King Arthurs. Right. This is us. In King List number. 28, and this is repeated in numbers of manuscripts. Tudric was Theodric, correct. He figures hugely in the histories. Uh, Morris, Murig, Moirig, and then you get Arthur. Arthur is, you know, Arthur, Arthur II. The second. The Vivian archaeologists, the Boots of England, the Anglo Saxon, Saxon Chronicles, uh, Geoffrey of Westminster, Henry of Huntington. There's a plethora of documents mm -hmm. and um, references to these this particular King Arthur II. Mm -hmm. You see, so they're appearing, and if you put the genealogy together from these lists, out you get it. And what year are we talking? Arthur II, he, he turns out to be born 503, and he dies almost certainly in 579. Mm -hmm. So, once you've tackled the problem of where to start looking, mm -hmm. you then have another problem of, uh, you know, getting the dates right. Mm -hmm. Now, another source turns out to be the Brutes of England, the official histories of the English people. Now, these, are, again, have been much maligned and uh, abused mm -hmm. because they don't say what the universities want them to say. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure if you could turn the clock back, the scholars would be right for them. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, uh, in here you have Wodges, the Brutes of England, who huge chunks on King Arthur. Mm -hmm. They talk about Arthur II. Actually, they're talking about Arthur II and Arthur I. They haven't managed to disentangle them. Mm -hmm. But in the case of Arthur II, they actually say, and when King Arthur had thus his knights feasted about April after the next sowing, he's over in Brittany, he came again into Britain, his own land. And when after Whitsuntide next sowing, by counsel of his barons, he would be crowned King of Glamorgan. That's a bit of a bold statement, isn't it? But they also give the date of his death, you see. And the date is pages and pages about this guy. He's supposed to be non-existent. <laughs> the funny thing is everybody writes, ooh. Mm -hmm. And this is like ancient stuff. And it's been written in England, right? Uh, they actually say that he dies in 500 and I work at 46. It's impossible. You see, what they're doing... The Brits dated their sort of dating from the crucifixion. They were Gnostic Christians of a sort. So year one is 34 AD. Mm -hmm. right? The Roman Church dated 
their birth. calendar from the birth of Jesus. So you've got a 33-year gap. Once you realize that, all this muddle, and there is a tremendous muddle in Dark Age British history, it all falls into place. It's not muddled anymore. You see? And once you realize 546 plus 33 is 579, you're in business. So the Brutes of England were another source, and I'm giving you a rundown on, there are dozens of books and places, right? The other thing is that um, once we've established the two Arthurs, we start to get a dating pattern right. You see, the Battle of Baden is not 570 AD, the Battle of Baden is about 550 AD, it's 33 years later. And the Battle of Camlan slips backwards, right? It's not 535, it's about 568, something like that. And again, that makes sense in the histories. The Welsh histories then begin to make sense. They previously said these histories are terrible, they're muddled, you know. They're not. The dating has to be put right. Mm -hmm. But I must emphasise, Alan has been a passionate historian for 60 years. Mm -hmm. So I think, he, it's, I think after 60 years of historical research, I think he should know something about it. Mm -hmm. The records are multitudinous. What I'm saying is, is there are sources all over the place which have not been properly used. Uh, Badass, written uh, 1800s, again, by Oxford scholars. And again, they exhibit and they describe the origins and the where and wherefore of this much maligned alphabet. And the alphabet of being alleged of forgery was the main weapon used to discredit histories. Now there are stones in Wales and in Scotland and in England that contain the Carbon alphabet written on it. Mm. And sometimes the alphabet is mixed with Latin letters. So where well, they couldn't get a British sound from the Latin letter, they put a Carbon alphabet. Right. Uh, they got round that one with a man named Collingwood who's from Northumberland of all places. And he said that um, all carving of stones and ancient stones started in Northumberland, in Britain. And they then spread, and they then taught the Irish how to carve stones. The Irish will be pleased, right? And when the Welsh wanted a stone carved and inscribed, they sent for the Irish to come and do it for them. So when you get a stone in Wales with cauldron on, or with a mixed Latin cauldron text, it's Latin and Irish. Now this has caused pandemonium because you lose the stone of King Moirig, Morris, Arthur the second's father. It's there, for all to see. And where is that stone, Alan? It's in Margamabi. You lose the stone of King Tithbald and you lose the stone of King Tudrig because the names have been <laughs> they're incorporated. Mm -hmm. They're not Irish at all. And the allegation that the Welsh couldn't carve a bloody stone and needed an Irishman to come and do it, is disgraceful. But the archaeologists are mainly English, and they love this. Uh, you've got the land of charters. Uh, the land of charters do record King Arthur, yes. And he makes land grants. And his father does, and his grandfather does, and his sons and grandsons do. So the idea, the idea is the land of charters. They're in Latin and then translated into Welsh. And... Uh, they, they clearly exhibit grants by all sorts of people, including Arthur II. So what di where does that date from, the land of charters? They were compiled uh, down the centuries as they were made. They start uh, the Lancaven Abbey charters around 400. Uh, these seem to commence around the 470 year, around there, maybe a little later. And they go on to 1120. In the margins of these charters, they often wrote notes of historical importance. You know, the charter written down the middle, they write all sorts of notes on the margins. Mm -hmm. So we, what they do, they record the charters given by the kings and major princes to the church. Mm -hmm. And they also say who was there, his brother was there, his father was there, or his son was there. And you get a cascade of the kings down through the centuries. And so you've got a comprehensive list of the kings of Glamorgan and Gwent. South East Wales, and the Bishop of Lambeth. There's nothing like it. 
be it known to the clergy and people of southern Britain that Athwys, that's him, right, king of the region of Gwent, granted the God and St. Debricius and St. Tylo, Tylo's his uh, first cousin, Debricius Duffley crowned him, uh, uh, in the hand of Bishop Comerick, he's a local bishop, right? The church of Kinbach and so on and so on. King Arthuris went round the whole territory in its circuit, sprinkling of the dust with a sepulchre of St. Kinbach. And it goes on. He parades round the entire circuit of thing, And the king alone carried the gospel on his back and confirmed forever the arms that had been given for the soul of his father, Midic. He's given the church a bit of land so they can pray for his daddy. And it says who's there, uh, the, all the abbots and bishops who attend and all the relatives of the king who attend this ceremony. So what you do, you, you, get a, you, you can build up a who's who of the entire sort of royal family. Mm. This is a copy Sorry. of the Mavernian archaeology. And uh, again, they fall, these books fall apart if you use them. It's a couple of, this is 200 years old and more, see. There's a whole wadge in the front of ancient poetry, masses, over 230 ancient poems, some of them very long, right? And a lot of them deal with Arthur and the, two, the burial of Arthur and his death. And the information in these poems is massive on, because they, they deal with numbers of princes, their exploits and their deaths and this sort of thing. Can you give us an example, Alan? One of the famous ones is a dialogue between Arthur and a fellow named um, Lulod. And Lulod is important because Lulod means coloured man. It means a brown-skinned man, not a black man, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot here by Taliesin, who is the Merlin figure. Between Arthur, son of Uther, and his nephew, Lulod, the son of Madoc, the son of Uther. Okay? That's what it's between. Right. So Arthur's got a brother named Madoc, who is Madoc Malfran, Madoc of the Seaweeds, or Madoc the Cormorant. Okay? Uh, you say that, obviously. And uh, it goes on. Now, Arthur asks the question, Lulod, Oilod, he answers three times. Arthur asks another question, and Lulod answers. And it goes on like that, question and answer, right the way through. Okay. They're talking about a great, great strange land out across the ocean, which is vast. And there are huge mountain ranges, great lakes, massive rivers. And Arthur's asking, well, are there kings ruling this place? And he says, no, there's no, there's no kings. You know. so, are there coast guards guarding it? He says, no, nobody. Uh, it's there for the taking, you see. And he, he's planning, you can see what's coming. He's planning an expedition, you see. And you think it's America? Well, Arthur then sails out of Milford Haven with 700 ships. So where is he going? We piece together the story out of the poetry and out of the lives of the saints a lot of the, the various histories, because there you see there, there are six ancient histories in here. Six, mm -hmm. which are generally ignored. And they contain massive information. They interlock with the poetry. They interlock with the lives of the saints. They seem and appear to be accurate. And where it's possible to compare them with the Roman records, they tie up. Mm -hmm. And so we've got six histories, several hundred poems, right? And these are then you've got lives of the saints, and as they give the, the saint, you couldn't be a saint unless you were royal or noble family. Ordinary people couldn't be saints. So you have the saint's father and mother and their ancestry all listed down, all the genealogies of saints, you see. Well, these are all people from the royal and noble families. So it adds further to this agglomeration and cementing together. Now, I must emphasize... One of these experts said that a book is required, a book in a sort of a brave heart sort of format. A, a fictional book to sum up the, the, the Welsh King Arthur. We've King done Arthur's. a book on that, it's the Arthur the War King. Mm -hmm. This is the tear. Mm -hmm. it's a, everybody who's read that thinks it's absolutely awesome. All of your other books are non-fiction, though. They're, they're, sci they're, they're basically historical research yeah. and evidence-driven. Yeah. Arthur one, the War King is a f historical novel based on fact. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, Professor Morgan did um, say the necessity for such a book, mm -hmm. and there is a book it, 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 which has already been written. Yeah. In one say Live of the Saints, he arranges the marriage of Gladys with Brocken of Brecon, who's his first cousin, 
and Brocken and, and Gladys get married. Gladys is the daughter of Gwynthru, who's a pirate living in Newport. Well, there's no Newport on the earth. They, when they were digging out Newport docks, they found the remains of ancient ships in the mud, but they didn't bother preserve them. Arthur has a celebrated meeting with Gildas, because he executed Gildas' brother, Hoyle, cut his head off. And so he goes to Lancarbon Abbey, which is 10 miles west of Cardiff, and he and Gildas have a celebrated meeting. So it's, it's peppered everywhere. St. Ulthid is the first cousin of King Arthur. In the life of Ilthid, you get King Arthur. You published quite a prominent book in 1986 called Arturius Rex Discovered. Arts, Arturius Rex dis, dis, um, Discovered is, the, is a more of a popular edition, hardcover. Mm -hmm. It depicts the, the accession memorial stone of King Arthur II on the front cover, in fact. Mm -hmm. And um, in, it, it was a very popular, well-received book, at least in South Wales. But now it's... it's very popular on the internet, and um, everybody who reads it thinks it's absolutely excellent. And, and of course, that book was written before the King Arthur burial cross was uncovered or was was excavated. That is the point. It was done before the excavation, mm -hmm. so we couldn't be making things up. Mm -hmm. uh, in Nennius, who was a celebrated historian, as they were on the eight hundred. And in the life of Sinotid, the burial is described in detail. He's first brought in by ship up the river Aweni, and he's placed and buried in a cave. He's later taken out of the cave and placed and buried under a church. The church of St. Peter's is associated with King Arthur II. We went along, saw that the, the ruin was in the right spot, and that all the place names around it were right. Port Rev, a uh, uh, supreme place. Uh, you get uh, the names uh, where the, the great massacre occurred is there. It's Had you already named the site in that book of St. Peter's the, Church? We mentioned the site of St. Peter's Church. There's right. photographs of St. Peter's Church within the book. Mm -hmm. We mentioned the stone in the book, which was found in, a, in an excavation, a pre-excavation in 1986, just before the book was published. And that's right. what actually inspired us to proceed immediately to publish the book. Right. See, in Wales you get fields on a tithe map. The tithe map was drawn for the church in that. And each field is drawn very carefully and the acreage is expressed. And the field's given a number. Then the tithe book gives the number of the field, its acreage, who owns it, who may farm it if it's not the owner, and the amount of tithe that's got to be paid to the church. So all Welsh fields, in, certainly in South Wales, had names. And they were named for events. <laughs> So you can actually read the history in the land. It tells you where the beer tent was, where the quarrel started, and where the massacre occurred, in the, the tithe maps. Mm -hmm. And you can find information in all sorts of places if you know how to look. The sword-shaped stone was actually part of the fabric. Right. And the, the archaeologists have written up a report actually revealing where it came from in the war. Right. It's Car Car the castle of Caradoc. There's the ruins of an ancient castle there. Of course, the archaeologists don't even know it's there. The tower bases are in the fields and the walls. Uh, King Caradoc, the first who fought the Romans, uh, the highest spot on the hill is Twin Caradoc. There's a big grave mound there. St. Peter's Church, the excavation in 1990, um, one of our, there was about 50 people involved in the excavation altogether, but one of the, basically the groundwork has, Richard Melbourne actually found a electrum cross. Well, sadly, he's passed away now, but he found that, and um, that is one of the most, perhaps if not the most compelling, tangible artifacts we found at the site in that excavation. And it's inscribed "Pro uh, Anima Artorius." It is indeed, yes. Which means for the soul of Arthur. Yeah. Now, we have had that um, tested, tested, thoroughly tested, and it's typical of artefacts of that period. Now, now, the important thing is that this was dug up after you had purchased the land, because you purchased that land because you thought that was the resting place of King Arthur II. And then at some point later, it was excavated, and then you found this cross. Correct. Basically... We thought it warranted excavation in, in view of the, all the evidence which 
we have already accumulated with some of the formidable team and one of the basically labourers really just happened to find the cross. It's, oh, it's above Brenner, uh, the village of Brenner. Which is Hallen. in South West Wales. It's in South Wales, uh, in mid, I'd say mid Glamorgan. It's there, anybody can go and see it. And then it leads on to other, you can start reading the type maps, you can find out where the loot is. <laughs> there's a giant sort of bolt shape in the ground and there's a grave mound there. And Uther Pendragon is buried in the ground, mound in the great circle at Kai Karadok. That is Kai Karadok, because the castle of Karadok's there, the grave of Karadok's there. And St. Peter's Church is at Sky Crack. The name of that church is St. Peter's. Now, Vortigen's ambassadors met Emery Smiley, the crown prince, Emery, right? The jeweled prince, right? And his mother at St. Peter's Church. I think that it would set them up with a tourist. There are only three million people there. It's the same size as Birmingham. <laughs> it's suburbs, right? And uh, I think it would set them up for all time as a tourist mecca. Because we, we touched on a fraction of us. A tourist mecca? Oh, yeah. I would think at a minimum 30,000 jobs. See, a tourist job's permanent. Mm. You can't take the pyramids away. People don't see them. But a factory is not permanent. These larger books, you know, this, this was written for Charles II of England. There's a copy there. It gives his genealogy. And he traces his right to be king of England back to the prince's wills. And all through the piece, the Duke of York, the Duke of Northumberland, all of them, they all trace their ancestry back to Welsh. It's, it, it's there if you want to look at it. Take advantage of it. Take advantage of it every possible way. Uh, get the industry set up and running. Try to promote the construction of hotels. Uh, there are numbers of sites right through Wales. It's not just one area, it, it, although there's a concentration there. There are sites all over the place which are Arthur I and Arthur II and into the Midlands, uh, get the, the, the tourist industry on its feet and start it going. Make the doodads to sell to people. Don't let the people in Hong Kong make tourist maps. Or, you know, there's a minimum of 20,000 jobs in this. And I said, well, you don't even know half of it yet. <laughs> If you live in South Wales and would like to see something done about this and many of the other historical sites, then why not contact your council or parliament? After all, they are supposed to work for you. I'm Richard D. Hall. Good night.